Hey, what's up? It's Jesko from AcousticsInsider.com, where I teach home studio acoustic treatment techniques for audio professionals, but without all the voodoo. I've got a real special episode for you today because I am joined by Andrea Cicero. Cicero, am I saying that correctly? Cicero. 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 <laughs> yes. Obviously, Thank I should you, ask that. Jesko. <laughs> no problem. It's a pleasure yeah, to be yeah. here for me. <laughs> It's a, it's a pleasure having you on. Thanks so much for, for, for coming on. Um, Andrea is an acoustic consultant, a, acoustic engineer, an acoustics researcher, and uh, he's going to talk a bit more about his background in a second. What I'm going to ask him to talk to you guys about today is his work on a platform called Audium, which he started, which is a tool that he really designed for us kind of home studio folks, but also kind of acoustic engineers building home studios, building critical listening spaces, which goes beyond what we've seen so far. Yeah, So we've had very simple tools to analyze uh, room modes, standing waves in rooms so far. We've had measurement software, but taking it that next step, we haven't really seen that yet. And Andrea has started this platform, has created this platform that allows us to take that next step. And that's what I want to show you with him Uh, I want to give, get some background on what it actually takes to develop a tool like that, why we haven't seen it so far. Um, so we're going to take a deep dive into acoustics theory, into low end, into measurements, into analysis, into modeling. Yeah, so this is going to be a pretty in-depth episode. Um, and hopefully I can give you guys some perspective on why it is so challenging to treat these small rooms that we're in, these home studios, Because it's a common misconception to think the room gets smaller and everything gets easier. But in the end, it's actually quite the opposite. The room gets smaller and everything gets way more difficult. And um, so I'm going to talk to Andrea about why that is and actually what it takes to deal with these small rooms. But before we get into that, if you want to follow along with the, the typical process that I teach to treat home studios, I want you to check out my home studio treatment framework which you can download at the link in the description. These are my five steps to systematically treat a home studio and get it to translate. So this is the process that I teach and that I also go through when I uh, treat home studios. It's a very top level view on the steps that you need to take in that order to take the room from empty to fully treated. So obviously setting up your speakers, finding your listening position, using porous absorption, using resonance absorption, using measurements, speaker decoupling, subwoofers. It's all in there laid out in the order that I recommend that you take them in, but also how to look at each of these steps and what to really take away from them, how to put it all together. So if you're in the process of treating your home studio, you want to know what the next step is for you or you're, you're challenged with a particular problem, you don't know what it is you need to look at in order to get that fixed, I want you to download my home studio treatment framework at the link in the description. But with that, uh, Andrea, let's get to you and, uh, and all the work that you do. Can you maybe just start us off by just talking a bit about how you actually ended up being a researcher, how you ended up starting your company, AC Acoustics, and then finally Audium as well. But what is your path? How did you get to where you are now? Yes, thank you, Hesko. Um, basically, my path started uh, way back in 2013, roughly, when uh, I was a civil engineering student. And um, yeah, I used to play bass, uh, still try and play it um basically uh i came across one of these modules called called building physics uh in um at university which comprises all thermal and uh, uh and all the all the physics that basically happen in a normal building um and amongst the physics there's there's acoustics of course uh so when we talk about acoustics it's a very broad field Uh, that has many aspects, many applications on any any field. And uh, basically, it was love at first sight because for the first time I, I saw the combination of something that sounded <laughs> or like sound waves with, with engineering. And um, basically, I wanted to do that from, from that point on. <clears throat> the only problem was that, you know, again, at university was a beat uh, a portion of a module in the whole course so uh, there was no way to 
get deeper knowledge on these uh, in this subject. So basically, I decided to do it properly because that's what I wanted to do. And uh, in 2016, I moved to UK uh, to Salford, which is one of the best place to, to best places to study acoustics. And there, I did my MSc degree, Master of Science. It was uh, one year full time, and when I mean full time, it was full time. <laughs> so yeah. it was 18 hours a day, basically, of study <laughs> for one year, and. Uh, that was probably the best experience of my life because that was a turning point in terms of knowledge, skills, uh, networking, and um, <clears throat> I I got the chance to meet great teachers and great people there. And also, I mean, I felt finally ready to take on uh, the the work. So yeah. uh, after that, I moved to London to work, and I worked for three years uh, for an acoustic consultancy firm, uh, working mainly on performing arts buildings, so theatres, music schools, music schools, and uh, um, all fascinating projects as well as normal building. Then COVID came, and uh, so it was time to go back home, probably, <laughs> and uh, I decided to move back to Italy uh where things are not as developed as uk but i wanted to give you a go and uh, so my first conception of audium was was up and in, in the uk so um i got like it it happened for several reasons that maybe we, we we can explain later uh but basically yeah with audium now i'm basically got rid of some geographical constraints so mm -hmm. I, it's it's possible to to work uh, without the distance constraint and so based on that i i just started my company and uh i'm mainly working now with public buildings because still the, the the field that uh does the develop the most yeah but I also got get the chance to do home studios and uh some really nice and challenging projects yeah sweet okay so your focus is mainly on kind of the 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 um, uh yeah like well can you just describe like how your your, your yeah yeah kind of yeah, yeah basically out? so the 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 main focus is basically public buildings so uh by but i mean schools and uh, uh government buildings and railway stations and where there's a different approach compared to studios uh based the the chunk of the job that uh basically requires a lot of effort because there are low constraints and so you, you need to comply with low and that's where that's where consultants uh have their role the most but then uh on the music side of course uh happens to i mean at the moment, big recording studios are uh, is the business is the business of just some, which who do it from. We've done it for for loads of time, so for very long. Uh, whereas home studio is a is a is a growing. Uh, I wouldn't call it business, but basically, is a growing field because of spaces getting smaller, uh, budget getting lower. So it's um, it's something that people still want to invest money, not as much as a big recording studio, but they want to have a quality product. So they 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 are okay with hiring someone to to consult them because that will become their professional environment to work in. So that's another big part of the of the focus. So then, can you explain to me? why you decided that the time has come to actually invest time in developing Audium. I mean, yes. if you're, I guess, uh, like doing the other work is probably is, uh, takes enough time. Um, but wh why did you see the need or the why did you decide that it's you want to invest the time to actually develop these new tools? Yes, yeah, so that, that's a good question. And um, the, the, as, as I said before, the, the first conception of Audium was when I was back in UK, and actually the idea came, the idea came where when uh, some friends and some uh, other people called me from Italy saying, "Andrea, I would like to treat my room, and uh, I come. Uh, can you come and visit me?" And uh, so I really 
had no no way to to do that because uh, it would take me uh like fly fly there and fly back to italy and uh made made them pay a lot of of money so basically the idea of a remote survey was was the 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 one that started the whole audium team uh, which is yeah what now is the IR analysis uh, module, basically. At the time, it was a very rough idea, not very well built, but I managed to do it in a in a reduced way, and uh, so that that's where where it started. Um, so Audium started all, all from there, from the, this idea of uh, remote measurements, because uh, literally, like tools are available to people. Everyone can use a measurement mic. Everyone has got UmiQ with it. So everyone can take measurements without problems, just a few lines of instructions and that's it. Send pictures, send measurements, and then I can do that. And I managed to do a few room with this and I saw that it worked, but it wasn't as smooth as uh, as I would like, uh, as I wanted, because uh, it was all a manual process to uh, get the data from RoomyQ, read the data, and then uh, try and get some meaningful results, uh, weird scaling of the plots and stuff like that. So I decided, well, if I have to do this properly, I need to build a system that does everything automatically. And uh, in a few seconds, you get uh, all the information you need. Uh, you can follow like a, a framework in some sort, and then you, you basically don't pay a lot of money because it, having an acquisition coming to your house or even like all the manual process takes very long time and that means a lot of money uh in few clicks you can get all the information you want plus you get in some sort pass me the term like educated in what you're doing mm -hmm. so uh you go through what you're doing and it's not like the what you call the voodoo that stays on the acquisition side and uh just the client the client gets just the the final result without knowing what's going on so someone like uh someone likes this someone don't like like having going through the thing but i think it's a good way to 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 work with the client so just sharing what what what, what you're doing Absolutely. and then yeah yeah so that that was the first bit of audio but then with COVID and uh, moving back to italy all, all things stayed as there was but but I really wanted to to go further with this. So I forgot to mention that uh, two years ago I started an activity, a research activity with Salford. So because uh, I'm trying to juggle with juggling with between things, but yeah, I'm doing a part time uh, research activity with with them as well. And uh, basically that made me grow a lot in terms of coding and uh, programming and all the stuff like that. So uh, I really wanted to put these uh, into the practical side. So I took back what I left and uh, I started developing uh, IR analysis further. And then since all my research is based on room modes, then uh, I am I said, okay, there's, there's still some things that are there on the plate, but I would like them to, to become something. And that's how model came then. So it's uh, things on the modeling side now are becoming always more accessible. So I think it's the right time for to propose something like this. Absolutely. So you're you're working on this entirely on your own. Did you develop the website and everything on your own? So the, all the uh, calculation engine and all the modeling bit was done by me. But then I have a, a friend Adriano, which I want to say hello. Uh, he's doing all the web web de developing okay. uh, bit, so it's helping me a lot. Uh, it's okay. it's tough. Uh, it's not something to to uh, not possible to do all on, on your own yeah. unless you have 48, 48 hours a day. And uh, yeah, it's yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, yeah, but having someone that helps you with the web development helps you a lot because then you don't all the calculation and then it's 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 uh role to 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 put everything together and make it nice to people to present it and that's really the 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 second big component to this platform right that it makes it yes. so accessible to use these algorithms these calculations yeah because obviously exactly. the maths 
to to a large extent existed before but it was it, it, it integrating it in a way that is usable and then putting it on a, in a platform that is accessible yes uh, that's that's kind of the next step that uh, that we've missed all along right um, exactly so uh, that's where we we finally have access to these tools or, um, so so thanks again for, for <laughs> making that effort and taking the plunge i'm sure other people have thought about it but nobody ever took the plunge you know so yeah it's yeah it's uh i think uh, we're, we're going to see a lot of these things uh, in the very near future because uh people are starting on this side like this way to develop these kind of things because again computational power is what has been the very big limit so far so until four to five years ago you couldn't think of having this this type of calculation done this faster now with all cloud computing and uh, easy and accessible packages for advanced modeling it's possible to put together something and uh, make it work um yeah yeah amazing um <laughs> and maybe maybe that's the that's a good good uh, segue to transition into the, the 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 kind of the top level question that I want to use to lead us down the rabbit hole, which is in comparison to the other work that you do, when we're looking at these small rooms, what from your perspective, what makes treating these small rooms, building these home studios, what makes it so difficult? What are the yes. main challenges uh, that we're facing and what makes it so difficult? Yes. Yeah, so basically small rooms means limited space. And when we have limited space, that means uh smaller volume so everything goes up in frequency and also uh no space for good treatment or at least very limited space for good treatment and the final uh aspect is that everything interacts in the room very closely so basically what happens we get this resonant behavior of the room which is what we call room modes um that's that's the main challenge because uh in a very large space these room modes are still there but they're probably below 20 hertz or slightly above so we don't even hear their effect on our perception uh or or basically they're not there as they're, they're not a problem but in small rooms uh, it's it's all about them and i always see room modes as the lego bricks that build the sound field in a small room. So uh, what you're hearing below the so-called shredder frequency, which which is the the top frequencies up above which you don't get uh, this model behavior. Uh, everything below that is a combination of all room modes. Um, so it, it, I think it's a crucial aspect to look at when when, when treating a room because everything below that frequencies is do it. As some sort as is related to room to room modes. Yeah, I mean that's why I focus p purely on room modes when we're looking at uh, positioning the the listening position in the room. Exactly. Yeah, because the the it's the dominant behavior. I mean there are other effects, in particular obviously, obviously speaker boundary interference related effects, yes. um, but they are not as uh, strong. Yes, they're oftentimes they just don't appear, <laughs> yeah. and um, and they're much more uh, focused in frequency. So they're they are much while the the modal behavior, the resonant behavior is the entire low end spectrum. You might okay. get some speaker boundary interference somewhere there in the middle, but uh, overall the dominant behavior, the thing that really dictates the entire low end, is the um, is the modal behavior, right? Exactly. Exactly. And uh, yeah, uh, I mean, it's uh, it's critical to look at them because they they have impact on uh, the treatment you want to put in as well as speaker positioning, which is probably the most crucial bit of low frequency treatment. So uh, speaker position is is probably the most cost effective and and uh, efficient uh, way of treating at the low end. Then, of course, uh the, the the decay at lower frequencies is has got its part but then we need to deal with what we have so at some point uh it's just trying to get the best compromise in the room that that we have 
but basically what we can do is speaker positioning and uh i always think of, of room modes as a uh as a string on a base so the, the the volume of the room is a is a string and then you've got your peak which is the the source that you your source your loudspeaker and then i imagine this little insect or this little ant walking on the string so uh if you pick the string right at the middle and the insect is on the one of the edge which is one of the edges which, which are fixed then the, the insect is not moving. So the source is pumping energy, but the insect is not hearing anything. Whereas if you do the opposite, still the, the insect doesn't doesn't hear anything. So, but just because energy is not transmitted into the room. So, and if you do all the midway uh, scenarios, then you, you can see how much energy is pumped from the source and then received from, from the insect. And this is this this thing is valid with the first harmonic and the second harmonic as well. So if the insect is at the middle uh, and then I'm picking at the quarter wavelength, maybe the insect is listening or feeling the first harmonic, but not the second one. And again with third and fourth harmonic. So uh that's that's why it's so crucial to to place things properly. And uh, that's where a room mode calculator can can come handy. So even if we do, if you don't take into account uh, surface properties or source position in the actual room mode calculator, but just even in, just looking at the color plots, you realize how important it is to 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 get things right. That's such a great way to describe where or how room modes or the positioning in the room affects. Um what you're hearing dependent on the on, on these room modes right i love that that <laughs> idea with the insect because obviously we are the insect in this model yeah, right exactly. um and so um we really need to be careful where we place ourselves in order to get the right amount of energy from each of these resonances and uh, and finding a balance between all of them is kind of the crucial step to getting mm. a balanced low end yeah? exactly i mean there's so many there's so many so many paths that we could take down this um like <laughs> and the, the 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 engineer in me is also getting very interested maybe we should do a second interview at some point or talk about some of the the more in-depth stuff mm. uh, because i'm also just very curious about what you would have to say about uh, the interaction of uh, of room modes the interaction between room modes and uh, and speaker boundary interference effects for example yeah. Yeah. Um, all these sort of things, uh, but maybe that's taking things a bit too far, at this point at least. The the obvious question here for me is, this is all very simple. Has been very simple to calculate in a, a rectangular room with 100% reflective walls. Um, those calculators have been around for a while, but now we take things into the real world. So the rooms are not symmetrical anymore. Oftentimes the boundaries are not 100% reflective anymore. How does that affect the resonance behavior of that, of that space, of that volume? Well, that, that's a not that easy to answer a question because uh, as all the acoustics question, uh, the answer is it depends. But uh, basically, uh, I mean, the rectangular example is is the easiest because we have defined dimensions along the axis that they usually we we consider x x y and z and so anything is happening as a combination of these three axes so we can picture them quite well we understand quite well uh we define actual modes oblique modes tangent modes uh just because you you can give a name to everything the problem with odd rooms is that you don't have that matching between dimension, the three dimensions and the, the, the position of the surfaces of the room. So anything goes like it's it's just a physical system that then has its own behavior. And uh, depending on the distance between the surfaces, depending on the uh, ratios between the surfaces, that, that changes quite a lot. And for instance, if, if we take the L-shaped, room which can be thought initially as uh as the, the the closest to the rectangular one like you you can think of it as a combination of two cuboid rooms together yeah. the reality is not like that because then you got some sort of effects happening along 
the the L shape as well, and then all the ratios between the two legs uh, have an effect on on what's the final uh, frequency. So really, when when we go out of uh, of a perfect uh, example of a perfect scenario, things have so many variables that it's impossible to 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 give a name to things. So again, that that's why probably it's just but it's just better to have something. It's not it's not to to promote <laughs> the remote well, by, all, by all means promote it. That's what we're here <laughs> no, for. No, 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 but but that, that's the purpose of having something that calculates modes on uh uh in this in these different scenarios. Because again it's really hard to understand what's going on once you get out of that picture. So then t t t can you give me an overview of how do you then calculate resonances yes. in these room shapes? Yes. How, so how, do you, how do you do that? Yeah, so basically it's it's not that easy to explain but, but I'll try. So we 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 call we call it finite element method. So it's a numerical method that basically discretizes the room in many chunks. So the room is is what you can see from the calculator. So you got loads of little triangles and then there's a numerical solver that takes into account the geometry of the room and finds what's the state of this physical system at which you get a natural response. There's a very heavy mathematical explanation for this, but basically it's a different approach. I mean, the, what we calculate in rectangular rooms, it's because to solve that equation for rectangular rooms, we have a formula. So it's possible to derive a formula just because what I said before, you can name everything with X, Y, and Z. But then as soon as you go out from that perfect example, uh, things need to be done so in a numerical way. So it's it's an approximation of what you're doing. And uh, the system finds a solution where it naturally responds. So and that's how, what's happening. Yeah, behind, yeah, no, that's what's happening behind the scenes. OK. Um, how do you decide how small to make the chunks? Yes, so that that depends on the highest frequency you wanna you wanna calculate. Because um, the the very uh, the critical issue issues issue with with these numerical methods is that they have a heavy computational cost, as I, as I said before, and this cost increases with either the upper frequency you're considering or the size of the room. So that's why you, you still don't have such powerful tools for like doing a broadband uh, simulation all over the audible range. That's why usually it stops at, at low frequencies because you don't simulation are much shorter for reasonable volume uh, of the rooms. So the size of the triangle is, is, a, is related to the upper frequency. So uh, at the time of this interview, audio model is in its beta release, and uh, you've realized that you can't go above 120 hertz. I was just that's gonna ask you, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's, that's because we're testing the load on the server, and maybe going up and uh, higher in frequency uh, will can cause some issues, or at least the user must wait at least uh, 30 to 50 seconds and probably nothing is happening. So we are slowly releasing upper limit, uh, higher upper limit for, for frequency, but that's the reason behind it. That's okay. the reason behind uh, this limit at the moment. Okay. So at the moment, it's purely a, um, a computational limit. That, uh, yes, exactly. Uh, it's, it's more of a machine limit because the computation yeah. can be done, uh, but you right. either need more, more more powerful server or just set it in a way that it stays in a reasonable uh, computation times. Okay, gotcha. Because all the previous kind of room mode calculators, or at least the one that we've all been using, the AMROC room mode calculator, that uh, automatically, I think, limits, uh, sets the upper limit at the Schroeder frequency. Yes. Yeah, so is, is that kind of the goal for you as well? Or like, how do you, yes. how do you, how do you see the shorter frequency in all of this? Because it's a it's a it's a hypothetical number. Yes, it doesn't exist in reality. It's kind of very mm -hmm. arbitrary. You just kind of go 
you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, how, no, no. So how do you <laughs> feel about the Schroeder frequency and how you can incorporate that in your model? Yeah, again, it depends, not because it, there's not an answer, but I think there are multiple answers to, to this. So it really depends on uh, basically uh, what you're doing. So if you're designing an, a new room, you probably take that as a reference because it's the only thing that you have as a as given. So you yeah. just go, okay, I expect to be there. So I want to see what happens. But then once model density becomes very tight, you're just making the calculation longer and longer without actually having like a proper a benefit. Uh, a, a benefit, exactly. Uh, so I guess, yeah, ideally, uh, if the effort wasn't that much compared to like to go up there, I will just go for it and uh, and that's it. And then what, what I get, I get. But uh, in reality, it, going from 150 hertz to 250 hertz, the, the, the computation time is not scaling linearly. So it's scaling with the square of of the the, the, the frequency. So gotcha. um, it's a really hard effort. And again, it's possible to get there, but then you have to assess in this case, what's the benefit that you can get. Okay. And also, I mean, in terms of room modes, maybe at above for normal rooms, maybe going above 150, 160 might not be that meaningful. You you may want as well see the frequency response curve uh, in that frequency range, see if there's any com filtering effect in or interference uh, affecting the modes, and uh, that could be more beneficial. But then some other issues uh, came at that point because uh, basically at that point you want to see what actually materials are doing in the room. And then we we get to the big question mark of the whole acoustic research right now. So, how to model materials at low frequencies? That's the the big question at the moment. Uh, yeah. So, at which point you can be accurate in that frequency range? And because um, again, the slight change in absorption may change all the model interference. So, so you you just relying on numbers that you don't know if they are correct or not. So I think it's matter also to of interpreting results quite well and uh, see what, what effort is reasonable. So there are a couple of things in the model that I noticed uh, you probably consciously didn't put in. Yeah. So one thing that I mentioned at the start uh, when, we're talk when we're talking about simulations is just the actual materials of the wall, right? So in the model at the moment, it's still... 100 percent reflective correct um how uh, f well first of all are you planning to Im incorporate uh, actual material modeling into that model and if yes also just talk about how that actually changes the modal behavior the resonance behavior of the yes. space okay uh the answer is yes i'm planning but uh the big question at the moment is at what degree of accuracy uh because uh, basically most of the models that have been done so far have been done with a single figure for absorption, or in this case it's called the impedance, but let's call it absorption. Uh, so one value of absorption uh, covers the entire range from 20 to 150. That's the easiest thing to do. There's a bit of uh, fiddling with implementing this in the uh, user interface, uh, which I have to plan. Because uh, if, if I can just yeah. if I can just intervene, because at that point when we're just talking modeling the absorption, I think all that does is change the actual amplitude, I guess, right? Uh, it does. Uh, it depends on what you put put in, because uh, impedance is not just a number, a normal number; it's a complex number. That's why I was getting so, getting to because yeah. with the impedance, we obviously obviously have to also incorporate the phase change. Phase, That's a big exactly, difference exactly. than when we're talking just absorption, right? Do you want to yes. yeah, you want to talk about that? Yeah, yeah exactly. So basically. And the impedance is a complex uh, magnitude with uh, a complex number, which uh, has a real part that uh, represents how much energy is subtracted from the room. So whenever and I that's sound... the absorption bit. Yes, exactly. And then the complex part instead uh, uh, represents the phase change. So if I have a wobbly wall, it's maybe reflecting uh, all the energy, but it's, it's changing its time behavior so it goes yeah. back 
Uh, but just to yeah. just to give to yeah. give people an idea, explain that in other words, it you can kind of think of it as as delaying the reflection. Exactly. Right. So the the sound wave hits the wall, but then it doesn't directly get reflected. It actually kind of gets delayed, and so exactly. that's the phase change part of this uh, exactly. impedance of the this complex number that describes the the how the material uh, reflects the sound. Exactly. So what people have done so far, just for simplicity, is is to just give the real part of the absorption. As you do in any other acoustic modeling software, you just give the absorption coefficient and, and that's it. In reality, we know that in at low frequencies, uh we have we can have massive changes. For instance, let's take a helmet resonator. It can be zero absorption at 30 and one hundred uh, percent absorption at 35 and uh, depending on the Q and so how would you represent that with one single uh, number and uh, so again it's so it's very tough to understand what what kind of input uh, to put in to using the model because uh, you had to make things very complicated so it becomes even even difficult for the users to to realize what what to do or you either just set a preset for for things and then um you it becomes inaccurate it become yeah yeah exactly uh or you just i don't know uh, i have to think of what could be the best way but basically the the problem is there and uh, actually part of my research is to understand what's actually doing at room mode when you have dumping in the room because so far people have studied uh lightly dump at room so approximating uh like by lightly dumped i mean like uh plastable walls or stuff like that so still reflecting but introducing some some change in the behavior and you can in a good way uh approximate with rigid conditions with some fiddling in the numbers and that's it but when you got ev damping heavy damping it's um it's a problem and part of my research is to look at what happens to room modes when uh, when you have this much of dumping in the room and if it's if you can call it still a mode or uh, uh then the more the more you get into in depth the more the more you realize how little you can do so yeah. it's probably sometimes it, it's easier to keep things simple and uh, maybe with some experience as well try and, and combine this uh and see what what uh what best approximate what you want to do but if you go very in depth you you basically see that everything we've done so far is wrong and it's probably shouldn't be used so that that's that's the the main problem yeah yeah the typical challenge right so how yeah. how accurate do you make it while keeping it usable or in other ways uh how usable do you keep it while not making it so inaccurate that it's basically uh, useless right exactly exactly um, it's a, and it's a balancing act uh because you yeah you 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 don't want to demand too much of the people using it uh or rather um with most of us we if we if we made it so accurate that it actually represented a real life um right to the t it would be completely unusable we wouldn't know what yeah, to do with it exactly. um and i think for everybody watching this that's kind of one of the main challenges yeah with uh, wh why you are struggling with the low end in your room so much yeah people ask me all the time why can't you just simulate the entire thing and then it spits out some treatment solution and it's like well yeah technically you probably could but you'd need a supercomputer and there was yeah. there's like two people in the world who can use it you know <laughs> Exactly. No, that, um, that, that, that's the point. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so again, it, we, it's it's to this up, it's to decide up to which point to get. Yeah, but well, maybe that's a good a good transition also to talk about the actual treatment side of things. Yeah. So right yeah. now, a modal is literally just that a yeah. modal simulator. Yes. And it 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 very nicely. Uh, shows us the pressure distribution in odd radio sh shaped rooms and obviously uh, if you haven't seen it yet watch my, my my video from last week i'll also have links to audium in the description so you can check that out um but it's at the moment it is a room mode simulator and it's what well, that's what it does so then how do you take that and say okay 
here's the treatment that I need. How, what's, what's that step? How do you take that step? Okay. So basically, uh, the idea is to, uh, that the most immediate effect of room modes uh, in treatment, so studying room modes in treatment, is to see what's the decay of each single mode. So that can be computed quite in an easy way. Again, the main problem is to is what data you inputting. Uh, so that still introduces some some uncertainty. But then the the most immediate uh, application there is, is okay. I wanna I wanna introduce some panels in the room with some approximated data, and then the room calculator tells me tells me where is the room mode. And what actually is the decay of the single uh, resonance? So um, I don't know if you've seen it or people have seen it, but there's a publication from Salford from Bruno Fazenda where uh, limits for model decay times are set. So those are based on perceptual studies. And basically that could be a good reference of uh, what what what's the limit for each single resonance. So. The idea is like not to look at probably the frequency response curve, uh, at least in this case, because uh, it would be still subject to, to some sort of error. But uh, the model decay time would be the, a good indicator of uh, how good your treatment is. And so this, again, just the... quickly, so this, this tells us uh, what the kind of the, the, the threshold is from an auditory perception in yes. terms of modal de de decay time, like how short do we need to make it exactly. to the point where it is no longer a problem? Is that right? Correct. Exactly. That's exactly it. So basically, mm -hmm. when you have your waterfall plot in uh, RealMeQ, you just uh, that sets the limit on how steep the waterfall should be. So that that that's the the basically the idea. And Do you remember be, off the top of your head what that number is roughly? Like where? Uh, where it exists? depends on. Uh, so it's roughly point. I don't want to. I should have it here. Let me check. So I have it also, always handy with me. <laughs> okay, so that's that's the. I think the very nice plot that's been published on in this paper, and um, yeah, you have this threshold where at thirty-two hertz, you have a limit of. 0 0.9 seconds, so pretty high. Um, so that's because our, our, ears, our ears are not that sensitive to, to that, those frequencies. And then it drops dramatically to at 63, so you need to have 0 0.3 at 63 uh, to have DKs acceptable for music. So between 0 0.3 and 0 0.5. Roughly, is this and then, is this again? Is this also talking about a sixty decibel drop or like yes, a reference? just yes, but just for the single mode. So yeah. you you pick yeah. single mode and then yeah. you see what's what's yeah. the, what's. But the we're DK. kind of always referencing back to that uh, the sixty decibels drop that we originally yes. had from the from our reverb times, but yes, now just exactly. apply to that one frequency. Yes, just a single tone, and then of course it goes down up to two hundred hertz. But I will say this region is probably. Again, is yeah, having other some other effects. So yeah. I think the critical bit is this one. So from sixty three to hundred, uh, that's the that's to get these kind of values. In uh, interesting, yeah. I haven't seen this yet. I need to look at it. I mean, because also oh. that kind of works. That also works in our favor in terms of home studios because it means that the lowest frequencies, uh, or at least the room modes at the lowest frequencies, we don't need to control them as much. Um, yeah, exactly. From, exactly. A, from a perception perspective, um, as the ones higher up, and also, exactly. kind of, sixty-three hertz is a lot easier to treat than thirty hertz. So um, that also works in our favor. Um, can you can you talk a bit about um, porous absorption versus resonance absorption when we're looking at these at, at damping uh, resonances? What yes. like, what is what have you found? Kind so... of how that impacts the damping. Yeah, so basically, I mean, the, the problem, as you all know, with, poro, the, with poros is that you need great, like, large thicknesses to, to act in, the, in this uh, model, in this frequency range. And uh, that's often not available uh, in home studios. But then I will, I will then, after looking at that plot, uh, maybe I will check what 
and actually how much absorption you need because if you go like with uh, 30 centimeters on the walls that's that's done and that's it it works and uh, it's probably too much <laughs> uh but you've sorted out the problem so uh i think uh porous is a good approach because it um it covers most of the frequency range if the thickness is right whereas like a tuned uh, absorber like a panel absorber or a membrane absorber can suffer from phase uh, issues so if if you do your room mode uh, analysis and then you find that right spot but then in reality things are not as as the, what we've calculated uh it may be that the device does not work efficiently and uh, and also it works just at that tuned frequency. So you might need to increase the damping of the device, but then that's a very uh, delicate balancing uh, process because if you dump it too much, basically it's not working anymore. And uh, so- and also just how how do you even know how much you damp the thing? You know, that's- Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, well, if well, you're building we... this thing yourself, uh, yeah, exactly. It's like you're shooting. You're sh you're shooting in the dark. You know, it's it's, it's exactly. extremely hard to do. But but one thing you can do is basically um, maybe build a test uh, just for your room. Just build a test device and then compare measurements. That's the best thing to to do. So if you follow like a sort of standardized process and uh, uh, you you find that uh, results are clearly visible from. 60 hertz uh, on if you if you get it right uh below 60 but, hertz yeah. it becomes it becomes quite quite tricky to understand what's going on yeah and so uh, what you're saying is it's an iter iterative process right you need to yes, have a scientific exactly. method so when exactly. people ask me why don't you just uh, build some membrane traps and i'm just like well <laughs> sure well, uh, you have how many how many weeks do you have <laughs> yeah yeah no 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 exactly. it's uh the, the main problem again is uh, material data it's uh, low frequencies, it's material data. Because also another problem, uh, another, another issue is that, let's take a panel absorber. The panel absorber does not uh, vibrate just back and forth, but it vibrates back and forth on, uh, on, on its panels. So at another frequency, it's doing other stuff. So it may introduce some other funny, funny things in the, in the room response. So unless the like, tuned absorber are good if you're testing them if you if you're doing uh some tests in your in your room and you you find out and then you tune it uh until you you, you get it right but like giving a standardized uh absorption value for for tuned absorber is is very tricky very tricky yeah yeah um, I think this is a, a good point, maybe to to move on to the IR analysis tool. Yeah, yes. um, I think we've we've covered a lot of great detail on on uh, resonances, uh, low frequency resonances, room modes, aka standing waves, and uh, what that takes. And hopefully, by now, everybody watching has. Uh, if you if you haven't if you haven't checked out already, uh, you at least know by now why this is such a complicated topic and uh, it's why it's not so trivial, you know. So um, wh and why we often just focus on rules of thumb approaches uh, when we're teaching this stuff, because y if you want to have results, if you actually want to get results, we need to take a step back and make sure that what we're saying and what we're showing you actually works to some degree, <laughs> you know? And um, so that's, uh, I think that's that became clear from from this last half hour. Um, so maybe let's let's move on to the IR analysis tool. Um, yes. This is the first tool that you developed actually. And uh, I'm gonna look at that in depth in the next video that I do next week. This is a more, uh, this is a broader tool. It does a, a more stuff. Modal is just, yes. just, room uh, resonances and IR analysis actually takes a room EQ wizard measurement and then does a, uh, a comprehensive detailed analysis of various aspects of the room response. Can you maybe talk about, about why you picked the particular aspects that it looks at? Yes. So basically, um, there are several, several um, plots in the, in the IR, IR analysis reports. 
um, dealing with different different magnitudes and and uh, uh, parameters. And uh, the, the the first uh, the the idea came from uh, like actual actually we we have uh, some standards. They they are not like they are not like uh, uh, you don't have to be compliant as a as a law, but there are some guidelines and uh, um, the, for, for for building critical listening and listening environment. And that came from the ITU body uh, um, or EBU. There are some acronyms. Um, basically, that that's to standardize uh, rooms for listening tests. So to have scientific validity. Rooms where listening uh, tests are carried out must meet some some standards, and then basically it translates into good criteria for good con listening conditions. And so they give some a very detailed uh, uh, very detailed list of parameters to comply with, and so that's basically taken from from there. Uh, the only problem is that uh, maybe, as some user uh, has pointed out, maybe sometimes, especially in terms of frequency response, the the criterion is not uh, very good for for uh, uh, like mixing room mixing rooms or mastering rooms because maybe we want some still some character in the room, especially at low frequency. So you don't want that flat uh, curve, but some boost in the base is always good. Um, so basically, the, the, the IR analysis framework is based on, on that. And then I added some, especially the low frequency analysis of the impulse response. This is something that I wanted to, to add to that because uh, it, it's closely related to what I'm doing in model. So you will see that in the report, you find uh, the analysis of the model decay times. So the algorithm is uh, manages to pick all the frequencies that are more prominent and tell you what's the decay. Um, and then, so you can see if you are above or below the threshold. And then you you developed a kind of a, a scoring system at the very top. Um, and I, yes. I haven't, I haven't I, like, like I said, I haven't looked at it in detail yet, but I thought that was interesting because that is something that I saw with the Genelec grade report as well. Yes. I'm sure you are yes. aware of, of that, uh, their, their kind of approach. And they do a, a yes. scoring system at the top as well. Was that the, the, um, the inspiration for that? Or how, did, how yes. did that come about? And what are you, what benchmarks are you using to score the room? OK. <laughs> no, basically, the scoring idea, uh, I mean, again, I don't want to sound <laughs> like I thought of it before, but uh, it was maybe you original. did. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I, I thought of a scoring system that uh, basically gave the user uh, an immediate feedback of what's going on and what's not. Um, but then I saw that the grade system was uh, very refined in terms of scoring. Uh, of course, there are some hardware limitation because basically Genelec provides a dedicated hardware to do this, and all their their uh, smart monitoring system is is basically designed to do this, so they can get a lot more information on that. Uh, but basically, uh, in this second review of of the IR analysis uh, tool, I kind of refined what what the score system is doing, and actually, it's based on the percentage of values above or below the threshold or outside uh, the, the the good range. So at the moment, that's that's it. I don't know how well it translates at the moment with perceived quality, but uh, it's still I think it's still useful uh, for people to to see. Okay, that's the bit I need to work on the most. Okay, um, it's, I think it's a it's a it's a great way to kind of capture a first impression right before you then dive into the more detailed exactly. part of the analysis um, to really kind of look at what what particular things to 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 deal with or to um, to treat. You mentioned at the beginning uh, that you used this tool already with some people. And you yes. said that some things worked great, other things didn't work so great, if I remember that correctly. Or like, uh, yes. 
And can you just talk a bit about what, like, as, what as, you found in practice? What, uh, like, how? Yes. Which parts of this are the most useful? Which parts do you think are still need refinement, and why? Okay, so the the most useful again is the immediate feedback on results. So uh, both me and the client always found that uh, we always have a good feedback of what's going on uh, in the room before the treatment, and then we see what the treatment is doing, and then. It's also immediate to see if the project went okay or not. And uh, for me as well, like uh, if it went as I predicted or not. So because um, we, we we are very lazy. I mean, it's like processing results uh, even after the designing of the room is is always more work. And uh, once the project is finished, you don't wanna <laughs> you don't wanna do anything. Yeah. So in this way, I mean. You, you just get you just get results immediately and uh also uh, it was good for me in some, some very small rooms to see that actually what i what i thought it wasn't working actually wasn't working uh so you can see in some small rooms below uh 70 or 60 that's not you can do and uh model decay times are still there Whereas you see the improvement on the high end of the spectrum, um, where I think it needs to be improved again is main probably a more customized report for users. So at the moment you just have like a, for each plot you have the description of what it says, what it shows, and then some guidelines on how to treat the issue. But it's not like based on the results. So my idea would be one day to to just develop this in, in, a, in a way that it's, it's like a personal acoustician talking to you and uh, addressing your issues. And uh, another thing is that, of course, uh, the ITU criteria are not the only ones, uh, probably not the best for some aspects. So there are some house curves to, to, to comply with in some cases. So maybe Atmos now is is spreading so with their own criteria so so it's something that i would like to introduce in that i mean it's a i think it's a fascinating tool yeah and it's it seems like you're currently or you're constantly developing it further so i'm uh, i'm looking forward to uh, what's what kind of what you come up with next um in mm -hmm. and uh, and what we'll see implemented in the tool there's a whole bunch of things that I would love to talk to you about, um, also just purely from a from a scientific perspective, uh, interactions of different effects, um, how how to actually decipher certain things from the measurements, you know, like just just looking at, for example, looking at the measurements and saying this is a room mode and this isn't a room mode from a, okay. and, you know, um, s simple things like that can be sometimes fairly tricky, especially if they're like yeah. on top of each other. If we've got multiple effects all yep. sitting at the same frequency, especially also in the transition region, you know, um, all that stuff. I'd love to get your opinion on reverb times and how you think about reverb times, RT60 in particular, in these small rooms, because for me, I'm always like, who cares? <laughs> Nobody gives a shit about reverb times. You were talking about the different criteria, uh, the ITU, EBU criteria, where I definitely think of them as Yes, this is a good goal to reach, but it's not it's it's not uh, not by any means the best out there. I mean, yeah. if you're talking about mastering rooms, if we're looking at uh, someone like Northwood Acoustics, Thomas Jean Jean, when he when he, I'm sure his benchmarks are way 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 way, or his thresholds way way higher than just the ITU <laughs> uh, the ITU standard, you know. So. Um, there's so much there to talk, talk about and discuss when we're talking about studios. Um, and it's, it's, I think, if you're up for it, I'd love to get you on a second time at some point so we can dive more into that aspect of it all. Whenever um, you want. Um, but uh, there are two base, two main things I'd like you to, or I'd like, I'd like you to ask, I'd like to ask you to kind of round off this conversation. Uh, first up is at the moment we've got these two models, modal or these two. Uh, modules, modal and IR analysis. Long term, what are the other what other modules are you looking at, if any? Well, no, no, I, I definitely want to do a lot more. And uh, yeah, I can tell you what what my very long term uh, please <laughs> aim will be is to have just one tool to do everything. Uh, okay. Like just follow a framework and 
have oh. all the answers for for all the it's quite tricky uh i don't want to put that as a promise but uh it would be good uh, i think to to have something like that so um basically setting up a framework and then cover all the steps that take you to create a room and um yeah i think this these two at the moment are have been like of course quite challenging in terms of development and putting them out like also like there will be a very long uh, testing phase because uh, there are issues any any every day we get like user feedback and it's quite tricky to to deal with it but yeah in the long term it will be great to have a tool that basically covers most of the aspects of of the design and uh, especially if with time we get some more accurate information on how to deal with materials and low frequencies and um so that's that's the very long term goal yeah i mean that's the the holy grail right right uh, <laughs> and one other idea that just popped up uh, or something that i've been thinking a lot about is meta materials especially when yes. talking low frequency yes. um yeah. uh, damping or just low frequency control right i think there are there's some very promising um things happening in that space um exactly. and maybe something also to to talk about in a, in another in another um in another call Yes. But uh, maybe just to finish this off, one other question that I do get from people is people who want to get into the professional, the ac academic side of acoustics. You've gone down that path. You've studied with some of the best. Um, if somebody wants to get into acoustics professionally or academically, what would you say are some of the kind of prerequisites? What should you what should you really enjoy? uh what um what's a what what path should you aim for if you want to get into that space yeah so basically what what i found is that uh of course an engineering background of course uh, helps a lot unless you go down for a path like some acoustic engineering degrees like the one at Salford, the, the bachelor's got like some pre preliminary modules on maths and physics and stuff so but i think that's essential to uh, not only in terms of like technical skills, but uh, also like problem solving skills. And um, um, it, it's, I think it's essential. Uh, then in terms of what kind of engineering, probably I think electronic engineering or, or tele, telecom, uh, communication. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. Those are the best if you want to get into in the more audio aspect of, of acoustics. So and then have a broader knowledge in that side. Uh, for me, I, I, I'm more interested in the building part of, of, of the acoustics. So of course, like the civil engineering was a good background for me. But then when I get into DSP and the audio stuff, I mean, I had to a lot to catch up. So, um, but it's not in like major. I mean, it's not possible to have ideas uh, crystal clear from, from the beginning. So, uh, but what, what I would recommend is at least uh, trying and get into an engineering uh, path. And then nowadays there are so many courses all over Europe and I guess in the US as well, there are have great teachers and uh, but yeah, full immersion in these kind of courses is probably what you need to, to get to a high level and be ready to, to work in acoustics. Uh, it's possible to do it even if you have like sound engineer background or uh, studio background but then when it comes to m more technical bits uh unless you catch up with this engineer skills it's uh it may be sort of limiting factor there are exceptions of course uh loads of exceptions but and probably like you sometimes when you get into technical stuff you disregard a lot of practical stuff we which use usually is is quite is, is even more useful than numbers and and code but uh yeah in in the general sense uh that's that's the path that i would like to recommend yeah excellent andrea um thanks so much i think this is a a, a good uh, a good jumping off point let's leave it at that for now thanks so much for spending the time with me and and doing this this deep dive a deep dive with me 
uh, like Thank I mentioned, you. I'd love to I'd love to uh, get you back on and uh, go even deeper into the rabbit hole, discuss some more of the the, the nerdy stuff. Um, like I mentioned, I'm going to do uh, a video on the IR analysis tool next week. So every, for everybody watching, uh, have a look out for that. Um, and uh, but for now, I hope with this video, you got an impression of just what it takes to actually go into this entire analysis and modeling side of the acoustics in small rooms and that it's not a trivial thing at all and um that it's it's it is it is proper science it is proper engineering it's proper physics this isn't something that you can just uh kind of wing if you uh if you really really want to go into the depth of it um but it also shows why it's okay that this is a challenging topic for us you know if we are audio engineers and we want to work on music we want to record we want to mix and we spend some time on the acoustics to get the sound right but we're not we don't want to become professional acousticians it's it's normal that this is such a challenging topic and that we will un, uh, undoubtedly come across or uh, come uh, get to a certain boundary with our knowledge with our experience with our skill set that is basically impossible to to pass through to cross over unless you actually become an expert in the field and even then uh like with andrea you you become an expert in one particular aspect of acoustics um i mean you're already doing two which mm -hmm. is quite a lot you know but uh, acoustics is a broad field i mean we're not we're not even talking about or we haven't even mentioned that the side of things like transport there are acousticians that focus purely on the sound of cars you know, yeah. um, there are acousticians who focus purely on making sure that rockets don't shake themselves apart when they leave, leave the launch pad, you know. Exactly. Um, so there, it's a very, very broad field. Um, and we are just focusing on this tiny little niche in the within the niche within the niche. When we're talking about home studios, there are very, very few people working on this in comparison to the broader field of acoustics. And that's why it's also, in many ways, slow progress in terms of development and research, because this is, I mean, this is for you, you're, I I'm, I'm assume you're not making any serious money off of this at this point, at least, oh, hopefully no. may, that might change at some point, but um, it's a, it's a labor of love, you know, yeah. and, uh, and then you get a handful of people doing this professionally um who do make money off of this who make their living off of this and for them they clearly it's uh it's it's or it's understandable why they keep the experience and the knowledge that they gain through their through their life's work why they keep that very close to the chest you know um and so that's why it's a it's a very uh it's a branch of acoustics that is um, where progress is quite slow in the end if we're talking if we're comparing that to all the other aspects of acoustics out there right so again just to go full circle if you're treating your home studio and you're wondering why you're struggling that's why <laughs> yeah. um but yeah uh, andrea thanks again so much Let's thank you at that yeah thank you um, that was a pleasure for me and uh yeah yeah let's hope to have another one yeah absolutely i'm looking forward to it and for everybody else as always let's get back to learning to trust our ears and having fun making music in the studio i'll see you guys in the next video